shoes, <laughs> gospel shoes, the subject for today. We've been talking lately about the Christian as a soldier from Ephesians chapter 6, where it goes through the uh, various parts of the armor that we're called to put on, put on the full armor of God that you may stand against the attacks of the enemy. And uh, of those six parts of armor, we've talked about two previously. Two weeks ago, it was the belt of truth, emphasizing that we need truth both objectively and subjectively. We need to lay hold of the truth revealed by God in His Word with all of our heart. But we also need truth in us. We need to be truthful people, sincere, honest, open, transparent people, uh, in order to receive that truth and be helped by it. Uh, then last Sunday, it was about the breastplate of righteousness and the need to think rightly about our righteousness. And uh, we talked about that we, we all, every Christian has, every Christian must have two types of righteousness. First, the imputed righteousness of Christ, the righteousness of the Lord Jesus, His perfection, His perfect living imputed to your account, credited to you as a free gift. But then also the other side of that, the imparted righteousness, the fact that Scripture says every Christian will be growing in personal, practical holiness. We'll learn how to obey the Lord better and become more and more like Jesus. So we come today to the third item in a Christian spiritual armor, and it's described in Ephesians 6 and verse 15. I'll just read the one verse. It says, And having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. The ESV sounds a little less archaic. It says, as shoes for your feet, having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace. It's, it's actually not an easy verse to understand. Um, I mean, what does the gospel of peace mean? have to do with shoes anyway and 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 what is this preparation it says the preparation of the gospel or the readiness given of the gospel of peace what is that what's this preparation what's this readiness how does the gospel of peace which is somewhat somehow like a soldier's shoes how does that prepare you for anything how does that make you ready for anything well uh, by the Spirit's help, we'll talk about, talk about a, few, a few things along those lines. But let's first start out with, with just, uh, just some very simple questions. I mean, first just thinking about a soldier and a soldier's feet and a soldier's shoes. You might think shoes are not very important for a soldier, at least com compared to those other things, right? Like the, the breastplate of righteousness. I mean, obviously the breastplate's important, the helmet's important, the shield and the sword, those are important. But, but shoes, are shoes a big deal? <laughs> oh yeah, they are. Why? Because we're talking about foot soldiers here. <laughs> Foot soldier. These are this is like Roman infantry is the idea here. These these are not guys that are riding around in Humvees all day. They're not even guys who get to ride in horses. <laughs> these these are guys that literally do everything they do on their feet. And so their shoes are actually a really big deal for their whole mission. And and as you would expect, Roman infantry, which which Paul and the Ephesians surely was had in mind, I mean they they were the best equipped army in the world and and they had excellent shoes that would give them advantages uh, over those that didn't have shoes or, or had bad shoes. Um, usually these soldiers wore sandals. But these sandals were not like your Crocs or your flip-flops. Okay, these were big, manly sandals. So, so, so picture like leather straps on them. Picture the really heavy, thick sole. And, and not only that, but the, the soles would have metal cleats, like studs sticking through them um, for traction. And, and so the verse is saying that those shoes, those soldier shoes, illustrate some personal, some, some spiritual truth 
about being a Christian soldier and specifically that our shoes as Christian soldiers, our shoes are gospel shoes. Uh, our shoes are, our feet are shod with the gospel of peace. The gospel of peace. Now, now that's a beautiful phrase, isn't it? The gospel of peace. I checked, and this is the only place, this is the only place in the Bible where that phrase shows up. So that means we need to talk about it. If we're here, we need to talk about the gospel of peace for, for a little bit first. I, I suspect there might be an intentional irony uh, in this from Paul's standpoint. I mean, here's this section with all this warfare imagery, and right in the midst of it, he interjects peace. You know, we have a gospel of peace, not, not warfare. I mean, if a Roman army is marching toward your town, you're pretty sure they're not coming with a message of peace. <laughs> they're coming to deal, you know, destruction and violence. But if Christians are coming toward you wearing gospel shoes, the gospel of peace, if they're bringing you the gospel, they're coming with peace. <laughs> they're coming with that very different message, real peace. On multiple levels. Now, before we can talk about all the peaceful results of the gospel, we need to just ask the question, what is the gospel? What is the gospel itself? Uh, what is the gospel anyway? Uh, I mean, I know we use that word pretty often in our Christian vocabulary. But, but what if, what if I, I pause the sermon right here and I went around and passed out sheets of paper to everybody? I declared a quiz. Declared a quiz, passed out sheets of paper to you all, and pencils, said you've got 15 minutes, write on that paper the gospel. What is the gospel? If you're going to tell somebody the gospel, what will you tell them? And you write it down. You know, what are you going to put? What's going to be on your paper at the end of 15 minutes? I mean, think about it. Think about what is the gospel? What would you say the gospel was? Back when we used to be able to do visitation at the, the county jail, you know, I'd get to see uh, lots of these, these guys that wanted to talk to a pastor. And, and so you get in the little room with them and you kind of exchange, exchange your life stories for a little while and get to know each other. And, and then often what I'd say to them is, is, hey, could I just explain the gospel for a while? Could I just talk through the gospel with you? And so... What would you say if you had that opportunity? Just explain the gospel to a lost person that didn't know, didn't know anything. What would you tell them? I think, I think this is one reason Christians do not evangelize or do not evangelize very effectively is they simply are not clear on the gospel. They're not clear on being able at least to clearly summarize for somebody else what the gospel is. And so let's just walk through the gospel, okay? Let's spend, here's the five-minute version. Here's a five-minute version of the gospel, all right? This is, this is the, the, the general shape that I would follow with that guy in, in the room. I'd take more than five minutes to talk through it, but here's a general shape. I usually start with God. I start with God. I start with God that created everything and also God who has spoken. God who has revealed himself in the scriptures. And, and then it's God as the Holy Spirit lawgiver. God has, God has given us all commandments that he expects us to perfectly follow. That's his standard. And then, then I talk about the problem of sin because we have not obeyed God's commandments. Adam and Eve at the very beginning, they disobeyed God and the world has been messed up ever since. And people have been messed up ever since. And we're all born with rotten hearts we love sin more than we love righteousness. And so all of us have a big sin problem. And God has said He's going to punish sin forever in eternal hell. And, and I tell them that is the bad news. That is the bad news of, of this gospel message. But the word gospel actually means good news, right? The gospel is the best news that I, I, I could tell you. The best news you will hear in your whole life is this reality that God so loved rotten, hell-deserving sinners like us. He so loved us so much that He gave His only begotten Son to come and save us from our sins, to make us holy, to, to fit us for heaven, to deliver us from all the mess we've made, and, and that, that, that 
Christ, the Son of God, was sent from heaven to earth. God took on human flesh and came among us. And he, and he came on a mission of mercy, a mission of salvation. He came and lived in this earth for, for 33 years of, of absolutely perfect living. Everything He did was good and right. He never sinned one time. And then He voluntarily laid down His life. He went to the cross. He died there as a sacrifice for our sins. There on the cross, He took upon Himself the punishment that we deserved for our sin. He suffered the outpouring of wrath we deserved for our sin there on the cross. And yes, He died on the cross, but He did not stay dead. And that's absolutely crucial for Christianity that Christ rose from the dead on the third day just as He said He would. And that resurrection proves three really important things. First, it proves that Jesus is everything that He claimed to be because He rose from the dead. Secondly, it proves that His sacrifice for sins was effective. It really worked. It really was acceptable. Otherwise, He just stays dead. If God had not accepted His sacrifice, if the debt was not really paid. And then thirdly, it proves that Jesus can give resurrection life to us, His people. He's the first fruits and those who were asleep. And, and so we look to His resurrection as a sample of what will happen to us. And so then the question is, how can I become one of His people? How can I get in on this everlasting life that Jesus gives, this resurrection power? How do I become a Christian? The Bible talks about two things that you must do in order to become a Christian. You must repent. Repent from your sin, your life of sin, selfishness, self-righteousness, Make an absolute surrender of your whole self to the Lord. Be ready to turn from those things. Be asking God for power to turn from them. Say, I've not no strings attached, Lord. I just I want you, I want you to take away my sin. I don't ever want to do that stuff anymore. That's repentance. And then at the other side, the second thing you must do is trust. It's faith. It's trusting in the Lord Jesus Christ that He did all those things to save you individually that he is my savior he is he is the one who's redeemed me by his righteous life his death his resurrection and so forth and when you become a christian god forgives all your sin as if you'd never done any of those things and god gives you all the righteousness of jesus as if you'd done nothing but good stuff your whole life and and You'll be resurrected at the end of the world. You'll live with the Lord forever in heaven. And it's totally a free gift of God's grace. That is good news. But that's not all the good news. There's more. <laughs> when you're saved, you're also born again. The Holy Spirit. The third person of the gods here. It's Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. All three involved in your salvation. The Holy Spirit comes to live in you the holy spirit it makes you new from the inside out he gives you spiritual life he gives you new desires and, and new power to become more and more like the lord jesus and not only that he gives you the ability because he's within you you have a personal relationship with the living god you know god and love god he is close to you now he's right within you that's what the christian life is like and 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 then i usually at some point give some personal testimony i think it's good to talk about ourselves. the apostle paul does well often he talks about his own experience becoming a christian so we should do that too with others just just say you know here's how i became a christian here's what it's been like for me as i've walked with the lord over over these years and 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 i emphasize that i am serving the lord not to earn something from him but i'm serving the lord because i love him because i'm i'm full of gratitude to him for all that he has given me 
And I'm happy to serve him. And I, I like to emphasize that the Christian life is not some grim, miserable thing. I'm one of the happiest people I know because I'm a Christian. And, and my, my days are, have plenty of hardship, but overall there's a sense of joy because I, because I know the Lord. Because I have all of his promises and his presence uh, with me. And, and, and that's why I want to share the gospel with other people. And, and then I turn it back to the person and say, you, sir, I, you need to become a Christian. This is for you. You can be saved today. You can, you can believe on the Lord Jesus today and turn from your sins and become a Christian. And God commands you to do that. Um, so there's a five minute summary of the Christian gospel. And of course, when you tell the story, you can use very different words, different illustrations. You, you could use lots of good Bible verses and whatever. Uh, but that's the basic shape of the, of the gospel story. And like I said, every believer needs to be clear on it. Every believer needs to be able to share the gospel story with somebody else. It's a matter of life and death that we get the gospel right when relate it to others. And... And I, would, and I would say this is not an academic exercise. Some of you here in the room have not become Christians. And so I urge you, believe the gospel. Believe these words. What The last five minutes of truth you just heard. There's enough there to save your immortal soul. And make you a Christian and live with Jesus forever. Believe on the Lord and you will be saved from your sins. But here in our text, this precious gospel is called specifically the gospel of peace. Why do you think that is? Why would it be called the gospel of peace? I think it's because the gospel is about producing peace. It brings about peace in all these places where there formerly was conflict and discord. The gospel brings peace. When, when Isaiah prophesied the coming of Christ, he called him the Prince of Peace. When, when the angels announced the birth of baby Jesus to the shepherds, they said, peace on earth, right? He came to bring peace. His gospel is a gospel of peace. So, so where is it that we see the gospel producing peace? Well, I think you start with peace between you and God. I mean, this is the big one. That's, that's the big problem, is, is that sinners and God are not at peace with each other. Uh, when you are a lost person, the wrath of holy God abides on you. The Bible says you are walking around. If you're not a Christian, you're walking around with the wrath of God over your head all the time. And, and, and in a moment, it could be unleashed in your eternal destruction. That's true. The Bible says that's not just scary talk. The Bible talks that way. About the wrath of God upon every lost person. I don't know how you can sleep tonight. If you know you're not a Christian. And if that thought ever comes a hold of your heart. You won't be able to sleep. And you'll seek the Lord until you know you found Him. But it's not just that God is angry at you for your sin. You're angry at God. <laughs> That's why you won't become a Christian. You're mad at God. You're in rebellion against Him. You don't want to live His way. You want to run your own life, do your own thing. That's how we all are by nature. So God's angry at us for our sins and we're angry at God for telling us what to do. And so there's this giant divide right between the, between the holy God and sinners. And who comes in the middle? <laughs> who comes in the middle of this great divide? It's the Lord Jesus Himself. He is the God-man. <laughs> He's the one who's able to be in the middle. Who's able to be the mediator between God and man. The man. Christ Jesus. Christ comes on a mission of reconciliation. To bring together these two warring parties. Of holy God and sinful man. Christ comes and he comes to fix the big problem. What is the problem that's caused, that's caused this separation between God and man? Sin. Right? Problem of sin. Christ comes to deal with the problem of sin. And he deals with it by taking it all on himself. Taking our guilt upon himself. Paying the penalty for sin himself. And thus removing the cause of all the enmity. There's other wonderful scriptures that talk about this. Romans 5 verse 1. 
Romans 5, 1, it says, Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. We have it. You've been saved. You have peace with God. It's your present position. You're not just hoping, well, maybe someday I'll have peace with God. You have it from day one when you're saved, when you're justified. And later on in Romans 5, verse 9, it says, Much more than having now been justified by His blood, we shall be saved from the wrath of God through Him. Talking about Jesus. For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of His Son, much more having been reconciled, we shall be saved by His life. We were enemies before, but we were reconciled. How? By the blood of Jesus Christ. He's made peace. The gospel makes peace. It's a gospel of peace. See, Colossians 1, verse 21, it says, Colossians 1, 21, Although you were formerly alienated and hostile in mind, engaged in evil deeds, yet He has now reconciled you in His fleshly body through death. You used to be, you used to be, antagonistic toward God, enmity against God, engaged in evil deeds. But Jesus has reconciled. How? By going to the cross and dying for you. That's what He did. One more, Colossians, the second, sorry, this is 2 Corinthians 5, verse 18. It says, Now all these things are from God who reconciled us to Himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation, namely that God was in Christ reconciling the world to Himself, not counting their trespasses against them, and He has committed to us the word of reconciliation. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God were making an appeal through us. We beg you, on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. We preach a gospel of reconciliation, a gospel of peace. We're telling people, you can be reconciled with God. You can be right with God. You can be restored. The relationship with God, like Adam and Eve had before they sinned, and better than that even through Christ. What good news this gospel is, this gospel of peace. Rather than being our enemy, God is now our friend And more than that, He's adopted us into His family. We're in His household. He is our Father. We cry to Him, Abba, Father, the Bible says. If you are a Christian, you must never again think of God scowling at you like a condemning judge. That is not biblical. Yes, we may grieve Him. We may experience His fatherly discipline. But the gospel has fundamentally changed things between you and God. There's no condemnation now for you. Peace has been made. You've been brought into the household. Once his enemy, now seated at his table. Right? That's real. It's the gospel of peace. Second way the gospel makes peace, though, it makes peace within you. (laughs) It makes peace between you and yourself. Inner peace. Is that a big deal? I mean, I've been a Christian a long time. I know, I know if, if, you know, once you're used to resting in Christ for years and years, you forget the degree of turmoil that's inside the souls of lost people that don't know the Lord. And, and some, you know, sometimes you, you're just reminded again that maybe anger that's often there, the fear of death. That's often there. The, the emptiness of everything people feel. The quiet desperation with which they live. The gnawing, guilty conscience that's, that's inside them. But when you get saved, when you enter into the gospel of peace, you know what? All oh, that changes. That, that inner turmoil just dramatically change and, and 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 what comes in is is love and joy and peace and the ministry of the spirit and and maybe it happens all at once maybe it happens gradually but things change on the inside god brings in peace inside of you in ways you never imagined possible and you realize that that now that you're in Christ, all these Bible promises are yours now. <laughs> They're yours. And so, and so God promises that, that He's going to work all things together for your good. You say, wow, that's, I guess I don't have to worry so much. And God promises that He'll supply all your needs according to His riches and glory in Christ Jesus. And you think, well, 
that solves a lot of problems, doesn't it? And, and, and you begin to, to feel peace about things that bothered you before. And, and then, then you run across Philippians 4, verse 6, and, and, you're just, and you're just blown away by that. Remember what it says, Be anxious for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. This God who is now your Father, who now loves you so much, you can pray to Him about everything. Everything that bothers you. If, you're, if there's something that's bothering you, even you think it's too small, if it's big enough to bother you, it's big enough for you to pray about to God. Take it to your Father. Take it to Him. If you're anxious about pray to Him, because then the next verse gives the promise. It says, And the peace of God, which surpasses all comprehension. It's like this goes way beyond. Well, you can even understand how this works. Goes way beyond comprehension. It says you, that peace of God will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. There's a supernatural peace that God can give you that guards your heart and mind from the degree of anxiety and turmoil you had before. This happens. Peace within ourselves through the gospel of peace. And then, thirdly, the gospel of peace brings peace between you and other people. Boy, there's a need for this one in there. <laughs> I mean, the division we see between people uh, just in America. I mean, it's the worst in my whole lifetime. Anyway, I, don't, I, didn't, I wasn't alive in the Vietnam era. Maybe it was bad back then, but man, it's sure bad now. Um, how, the, it, how polarized, how extreme people are. Just a desperate, hateful emotions pouring out. So sad. But when Jesus saves people, he calls us to be peacemakers. <laughs> he tells us, hey, forgive your enemies and love your enemies like God loves his enemies. I mean, that's amazing supernatural stuff. It's, it's hard enough to love your best friend. Jesus says, well, no, you're going to love your enemies and pray for them. Forgive them. The Christian, it says in Romans 12, the Christian is trying as so far as it be within you to be at peace with all men. We're peaceful people. We're trying to be at peace with everybody. We're trying to get along. And through His Gospel, Christ is bringing together people that don't normally get along. And He glories in it, what He has done. How He brings people together we just remember we spent a while on this back in ephesians chapter 2 um the i think the end of that chapter ephesians 2 verse 13 talking about how the, the jewish and gentile converts are brought together i mean you really those you can't imagine people any really any more different than that we're, we're so far removed we don't feel the impact of it but those people are very very alienated they both despised each other and and all of a sudden they're being thrown in the same church together and they have to get along but this is what it says ephesians Ephesians 2 verse 13, but now in Christ Jesus, you who formerly were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. So again, this is gospel essentials that are, that are unifying people. You're brought near by the blood of Christ for he himself is our peace. Who made both groups into one, broke down the barrier of the dividing wall by abolishing in his flesh the enmity, which is the law of commandments contained in ordinances, so that in himself he might make the two into one new man, thus establishing peace. Where's the peace happen? It happens in Christ. It's through the gospel. It's by, by, by people being related to Christ, coming into Christ, being united with Christ. They end up united to each other and at peace with each other. Well, it goes on, verse 16. And he, he might reconcile them both in one body to God through the cross, having put to death the enmity. Unity, peace between people. Colossians 3 verse 12 is another great passage about, about peace between folks. And, and he talks, it's, it's where he talks about bearing with each other, forgiving each other, whoever has a complaint against anyone, just as the Lord forgave you. So again, it's pointing back to the gospel. Say, look, look how much you've been forgiven. You better forgive other people. And, and then, then he says, beyond all these things, put on love, which is the perfect bond of unity. 
Next verse, let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you are called in one body, and be thankful. So again, Christ's our peace. He's bringing peace. He's demanding peace among his his saints. I've been disappointed, guys. I've been disappointed with the way many American Christians have handled things over this last year and the COVID disagreements and stuff. Man, I'm still I'm still hearing really sad stories from other places. Churches have been messed up. Pastors have been messed up. And oh, these script these scriptures are so are so powerful. They they set the standard so high. For the kind of peace that Christ expects of us. Why? Because it's a gospel of peace. Christ Christ rejoices to bring people together. People with differences. People with different opinions. They get along. Why? Because you're united to Christ in the gospel. Well, today's scripture then calls us to put on this gospel of peace. Like our shoes. Gospel shoes. And, And the verse says, if we do that. We will have readiness. We will have preparation. We'll be prepared for stuff when we've got our shoes on. And so the next question is, all right, well, how does that work? (laughs) How does wearing the right shoes make me better prepared as a Christian soldier? And I think here it's, it's helpful to think back, think back to the, to the imagery that, that, that Paul and the Ephesians would have had in mind of those, the, those Rome, the Roman infantrymen, uh, you know, strapping on in the morning, strapping on those, those big, big heavy sandals uh, and, and ask, well, how did that prepare him for success? How did that prepare that soldier for success in the battlefield? Um, Maybe, maybe that's, those are the same kind of ideas that we can apply to ourself. And, and so, and so I, I'd suggest, based on my study, it seemed like the commentary is all kind of coalesce in the same place here, that the shoes, shoes help that soldier in several ways, in, in his stability, his flexibility, and his mobility. And, and I think each of these factors can be related to our gospel shoes, how being rooted in the gospel prepares us in similar ways as it prepared that ancient soldier. So think first of stability. Stability. Um, imagine that you are a foot soldier in the infantry and you are, and you are, in, a, you are in a real fight. I mean, this, it's, you're not just marching around, you are, you are at you are in a in the heat of hand-to-hand combat with an assailant. What if what if in the midst of that you start slipping around? <laughs> and and what if you try you try to make some move against the guy you're fighting against and your foot slips out and you just fall fall down. You fall flat on your face in front of him. You're actually you're just going to be dead. You're going to be dead before you can get back up. I mean, you're just going to go whack and it'll be over, right? It's a big deal. Your traction, your stability, the grip of your shoes. When you put it in a combat setting, the same way a Christian who's grounded in the gospel is the one who's going to be stable. He's going to be stable. He's going to be strong. In any spiritual fight. The Christian who's grounded, who's got his gospel shoes on, he's he's going to have this unchanging mental framework of truth. These big realities of salvation, of Christ, are going to be right there in his mind all the time. He's going to have that. He's he's, He's going to know where he stands. He's going to have this 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 glorious salvation truth and he can be confident in those things and not be moved. When, you, when your faith is fixed on Christ in that way, you know who you're trusting. You know who you're following. And it gives stability to your whole life when you're clear and strong on the gospel. Compromising on gospel issues, on the other hand, is always disastrous. Oh, those big, those big realities of our salvation. You, you, you start going weak and wishy-washy on that man and you're in trouble. That's why Paul was so emphatic 
when he talks to the talks to the Galatians, Galatians 1 verse 6, he says, I'm amazed that you are so quickly deserting him who called you by the grace of Christ for a different gospel. Which is not really another, only there are some who are disturbing you and want to distort the gospel of Christ. It wasn't some totally new thing, it was just distorted, it was adjusted at the margin, some false teachers are coming and say, well, you know, this part of the gospel is right, but these other parts, we're going to, we can change that. We're going to adjust that. That's still true today, isn't it? That there's still pressure to adjust aspects of the gospel that are not popular. And it's a big deal, Paul says, even if we or an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel contrary to what we've preached to you, he's to be accursed. As we have said before, so I say again now, if any man is preaching you a gospel contrary to what you've received, he is to be accursed. I mean, we see that all the time. I mean, any time you see believers get moved away from the big realities of the gospel, start doubting and questioning that stuff, man, immediately they're weak, they're unstable, they're in trouble, they're useless. On the battlefield. What do they need to do? They need to get on the gospel shoes. They need to get the gospel shoes back on. And then all of a sudden you're stable <laughs> again. You can stand against the enemy. You know where you stand on the big stuff of Christ and salvation. Well then secondly, uh, the gospel shoes help us in the area of flexibility. Flexibility. A soldier equipped with the right shoes is ready for whatever. <laughs> He's ready for whatever his commander orders. That soldier might wake up in the morning having no idea what they're going to do that day. You know, maybe they're maybe they're going to march 25 miles. Uh, maybe um, they're going to be they're going to be climbing up some mountain pass. Maybe they're going to be wading through some swamp. Maybe they're going to be attacking some enemy outpost. Maybe they're going to really see some action today. He doesn't know. His commander knows. He doesn't need to know. He just gets himself ready. And if he's got the right shoes on, he's ready to do any of that stuff. Right? Whatever it is, I'm ready. I'm prepared. See, flexibility. He can adapt to different environments, different terrain, whatever the change of plans. In a similar way, a gospel-saturated Christian is flexible. He's ready to serve Jesus in any environment where, whatever place the Lord sends you, whatever opportunity the Lord gives you. I mean, there's things that just, that just quote unquote randomly, <laughs> we know it as providentially, just get thrown in your life. And you're, all of a sudden, here's a, here's a ministry opportunity. Here's a needy person that just gets dropped right at your doorstep somehow. And are you ready, are you ready to deal with them? Well, if you have on gospel shoes, you are, right? You, you already have, you're already clear on all the biggest things. And the biggest things that you can minister to somebody else. Um, I, I'm saying the gospel prepares you for whatever. The gospel is universally relevant. You don't have to know much about a person to know that they need Christ. That their biggest problem is sin. And their biggest need is salvation through the Lord Jesus Christ. And, and, and that Christ in Him crucified. That message applies to everybody everywhere at any time it makes you flexible if you're grounded in those things you've got something to say that can really help anybody the lord puts in your life think of it like that and and then and then when we keep the biggest things of the gospel big <laughs> and uncompromised then it helps us to see all the littler stuff in the right perspective um, I know Lloyd Jones, and he, he preached on this. He talked about, you know, there's all kinds of little details in how we do our church meetings, or or how our, how we how we do our evangelism attempts and whatever. And he says we do, we don't need to be stuck in how it was done in the 1800s or how it was done in the 1950s or whatever. Or just we're doing it this way because we've always done it this way. There's lots there's lots of little stuff. There's no Bible verse for that. It's just more preferences, more tradition, or whatever. And it's good to be flexible in those things. Say, our first question is, well, how, what about the gospel? Is the gospel honored in this? Is Christ honored? Is Christ and Him crucified honored in this? And if the answer is yes, then you say, well, maybe it's a good change. It's good to try things a different way. Uh, flexibility. The gospel gives 
that. It keeps us from being just rigid and brittle in ways that are not biblical at all. Um, we're clear on what the big things are where we take our stand, flexible on other things. And say so we've got to be flexible to respond to an enemy, an enemy that's always moving around. I mean, I mean, our, our enemy is, is changing his tactics all the time. We've talked about that before. One, one big problem in military strategy is, is the military tends to fight the last war all the time instead of, instead of being prepared for the current conflict, the current things going on. And, uh, and so you know, we can't always just be you know, trying to address what the devil did before. It's like, well, what's going on now? How can we be flexible to address him now? And so the gospel gives us that framework in which we can be flexible to address what is needed in the present day. Gospel shoes give a Christ-centered framework for recognizing that and dealing with the enemy in a timely way. So flexibility before that stability. And then third one, mobility. Uh, the Roman legions could outmaneuver most of their enemies. I mean, they could just they could just get up and go. They they could beat you. They could beat you with their shoes. Really, they they could march further. They could march faster. They they could surprise people that didn't think they could get there that fast. You know, there's those kind of stories in history. Good shoes helped them do that. Well, in the same way, gospel shoes can have that offensive attacking element in them. When you think of evangelism, evangelism is, is using gospel shoes in an offense type of way. Uh, when, you are, when you proclaim the gospel, when you faithfully sow the gospel seed, you are taking the fight to the enemy. And that's true whether it's some big public outreach or whether it's, it's sharing Christ with your lost grandma in the nursing home. You're taking, you're taking the fight to the enemy. You're pushing back against the gates of hell. And wherever your shoes take you, it's always true that the gospel is the power of God unto salvation. There's power in this gospel. Isaiah 52, verse 7, he says, How lovely on the mountains are the feet of him who brings good news. Beautiful feet. Why? Because they're the feet of a messenger bringing good news, who announces peace and brings good news of happiness, who announces salvation, who says to Zion, Your God reigns. And then this is quoted, you know, in Romans 10 in regard to evangelism. Right? Beautiful feet. Why? Because you're going, you're taking the gospel, you're covering ground to take the words of life to somebody. What's the first word of the Great Commission? The way it's often quoted. Go. Go, right? Go, therefore, to all the world. Make disciples of all the nations. That's mobility, right? That's movement. Go. That's putting down the phone, getting off the couch, putting on your gospel shoes, and going out and finding somebody to talk to about Jesus. So many ways we can do that. When it comes to evangelism, the devil surely wants us to stay quiet and stay scared and stay intimidated and stay distracted, stay discouraged, stay unbelieving, even be ashamed of the gospel. Like Paul talks about, but don't be those things. Guys, we've got, we've got good seed to sow. We've got a gospel that's always been powerful. And the same simple gospel message you can walk through in five minutes. It's the same gospel that the Lord Jesus has used for 2,000 years to build His church. It's the same thing. It seems so weak, but it's powerful by the Spirit. Even if nobody seems to listen to you when you share the gospel, I know this, that there's, there, there's just about nothing better for your own soul <laughs> than to try to share Christ with somebody else. It is so good for us. Why? Because it, it gets our focus off our own problems and you start to see the big, big things, the realities of heaven and hell 
the realities of the preciousness of Christ and what Christ has done for you and your heart gets stirred up with all that gospel truth again. So it's a blessing for yourself. But of course, we're looking to see the people around us redeemed by this gospel of grace. Do you think about it sometimes? That, you know, most of the folks you see at the grocery store are going to hell. And many of those folks have never once heard a real Christian clearly explain the gospel to them. See, everybody's heard this jumble of religious stuff. And when you talk to them, it's all just jumbled up. But, they, but how precious to have one Christian just explain the gospel in a simple, clear way. This is how it works. This is why Jesus is important. This is why the cross is important. This is how to be saved. This is what it means to be born again. We can do that. We can do that. Maybe you need a little practice. But you can all, any Christian can do that. If you've been saved yourself, you can tell somebody else what it means to be saved. What a big deal that is. Be able to communicate the gospel. Put on your gospel shoes. <laughs> sow the gospel seed. To go. <laughs> Mobility. I know COVID season has, has, has hindered evangelism in, in many ways and compared to the years before, but, but let's, let's swing that trend back the other way. And, and I mean, there's things we can do now gospel-wise if we, if we look for them. And, and I'm, you know, it's just things are going to open up more, obviously, over time in terms of gospel opportunities. Um, I don't think our greatest need in evangelism is so much coaching on particular techniques and strategies and things. I, I, I think it's, it's mainly to have your gospel shoes on all the time and be looking for opportunities to share. Be, be delighted in the Lord Jesus Christ and wanting people to know Him. Be seeing eternal realities clearly again. What it means to, that people are perishing without Christ. For that to get a hold of our hearts. To have a passion ultimately for the Christ of the gospel. And be ready to share him with a perishing world. It's not saying it in a certain way, whatever. We all have our own ways of communication. It ought to be you. <laughs> It'll be how you talk, how you share, what makes sense to you. I can't tell you how to do that. But I can encourage you, put on your gospel shoes and go. <laughs> go. Go find somebody to share with. It's good seed. There'll be good results. And we believe God that way. Amen.